So um, I've been asked at the beginning to audio describe myself. Um, so um, I'm me. How do you describe me? I'm grey hair, um, typical lockdown haircut where I haven't made it to the barber like Andy managed to before we locked down again. Um, I would normally say I'm unshaven, but I have a feeling it's now strayed over that border into a beard again. Um, I'm quite rounded in the face, wearing a red T-shirt. Um, and today I'm only joined by the yellow Labrador Barley, who is sat on the sofa behind me. So, as I say, we're in very strange times um, and we're going to use this very much as the first workshop that kind of lays the ground uh, for what comes next. And there's going to be obviously subsequent workshops where we can get a bit more hands on and do some more interesting things later on. Um, so what I want to do today, um, I want to talk about accessibility, but not on TV. Um, what I mean by this is, in essence, screens are all around us. Um, we have mobile phones, we have web browsers, we have head mounted displays. All of a sudden, the accessibility, uh, the traditional approaches to accessibility, I don't think are appropriate anymore. And that maybe there are new ways to do things and we should be looking at how to do that. So in essence, what this workshop is going to be focused on is what happens when you step away from the television and move into other areas. There's also a subtitle to this as well. Um, I introduced myself very briefly yesterday um, and suggested that I was a technologist rather than an engineer. Um, and a lot of the kind of underlying elements of what I want to talk to you about in this workshop today is more about hacking and why hacking has become important in terms of research. Um, so I mentioned yesterday that I was a technologist rather than an engineer. Um, and one of the takeaways that I want people to take from today is I have a great belief in research. Um, but I also believe um, that there's a great uh, area for where hacking becomes really important to us. Um, I wouldn't call myself a software engineer. I'd call myself a hacker. I, I can't write good code. I'm not very good at software engineering. I have no interest in going and sitting in a lab and becoming a software engineer. Where my passion is, is in the area of hacking things together. I know enough that I can build a demo overnight and I can put it in front of someone and that suddenly raises questions. And we can do the really interesting things simply by hacking lots of code together. Um, and once we've hacked the code together and got the ideas out to someone, we can hand it off to a software engineer that can actually do the work. But in terms of research, there is such an opportunity to um, actually get something together quickly in terms of doing user trials, asking questions, answering questions. Um, and to me, that is so much more exciting than the finished product at the other end. So I'm hoping one of the things I can do as I go through the workshop today is to justify to you why hacking is actually quite important. You don't have to write perfect code. You don't have to optimize what you're doing in the world of research. We just have to prove the point. And that's kind of where my passion lies. <coughs> I do apologize. I have a bit of a cough. Um, so today we're going to focus on subtitling. Um, but this work is also going to apply to all access services. Um, and we're going to go through a few different things. And, and hopefully we'll have a bit of fun. I'm going to point you at a few demos um, and Hopefully, although we're not quite as hands on. So let's get going. So what we're going to do, we have two kind of 90 minute blocks um, and I'm going to talk quite a lot in both of these blocks and we'll have a half an hour break in the middle. Um, but I'm also going to point you towards um, some demos, really, so that we can get a bit more hands on and open a little bit of discussion around it. Uh, what I really want to do is to tell you a kind of it's my story about how I got into immersive subtitling, um, how I got into accessibility. Um, and I'm going to do that by going through a few different projects that I've worked on in the past. Um, a disclaimer before we start, I am a technologist. I am not an expert at things like user tests. I've been involved in user tests. And so I, I feel it's a good opportunity to give you my experiences as a technologist looking in. Um, but I don't claim to be an expert on any of these things, and I'm happy to be told that I do things wrongly, etc. After all, it's one of those worlds where it's all about discussion. <coughs> um, what else was I going to say at that point? So 
we're going to go through four different kind of stages with the workshop today. Um, the first part, I'm going to talk a bit about my feelings about stepping away from the television. Um, when I first entered this world, I used to work for the BBC um, before moving to Salford University. And it was at the BBC where I first got interested in accessibility. And I'm almost ashamed to say from having been at the BBC that while I was there, accessibility was kind of the boring topic in the corner that no one was really that interested in playing with. And um, there were a couple of colleagues that were really passionate about the accessibility. Um, and it's amazing how it kills your flow when people try and enter the room. Um, I, I, there were a few people that were particularly passionate about accessibility. And so I found it was, they were asking questions that I felt could be answered relatively easily, but they didn't have the tools or skills to put them together. Um, and so I found myself while I was at BBC R&D starting to look at subtitling. And that's where I first kind of found my passion with that. Um, and so in the first section, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, the work I was doing at the BBC and how that kind of laid the ground for moving forwards. Um, and as you'll see, there is a, a kind of common theme throughout my work where it was a few hacks at the beginning suddenly changed a lot of people's minds and meant that I could move forwards. Um, the second component, I'm going to talk about what happens when you actually step into the video. Um, so in terms of immersive content, I don't know how many people have played with uh, head mounted displays, uh, 360 degree video, those kind of things. I'm going to use, um, you will have heard of the iMac project by now, the Immersive Accessibility Project. I'm going to use that as a, a kind of example case study for a project that made the first few steps into accessibility in terms of 360 degrees. Um, then we're going to have a break. Um, and by that point, you'll have had a bit of a play with a couple of demos. Uh, and then we're going to come back and I'm going to give you my honest opinions on how I found that European project. Um, I do consider myself an early career researcher. Um, this was the first major European project that I was involved in. Um, and I, I'm honest enough to say that I probably wasn't loud enough. I didn't put my foot down enough with my own ideas and kind of got swept along with other people's ideas. And I believe that the project did come out with some amazing results. But I think there were lessons to be learned from the way it happened. I don't think it went far enough. I think there was more work to do. It came out with a very safe solution, as I'll show you. Um, but I don't think it really exploited the opportunities that were available. <coughs> and so um, I want to talk a bit about why I don't think that went far enough. Um, and that's going to lead me quite nicely into talking about um, where we are today and how we've come up with uh, a new kind of rapid prototyping uh, framework for doing things with subtitles. Um, and hopefully I will take you through the process that we went through in terms of developing that. Um, and that will give you a kind of idea of a, a thought process from a technologist's perspective that was trying to answer some questions. Uh, and hopefully that will push us uh, towards some interesting demos and some more discussion towards the end. So if everyone's happy with that, hopefully um, that will work. So I wanted to start by talking a bit about uh, the first piece of work I did. Um, and this was <coughs> work I did at the BBC. So when I joined the BBC, everyone was ranting and raving about subtitles on television. This was the only way to do it. Two lines of text, 30 characters wide. And I came to the BBC as someone that had never used subtitles. So I didn't really understand what, what that really meant. Um, I was living more in a world where actually I was consuming media on a mobile phone. And to me, 30 characters wide, two lines of text didn't work on any any level. You just couldn't read it. Um, and this became even more interesting when you start moving into things like immersive environments where you can actually look around the environment. We've got more space. We can position things differently. Do we really want to still have those subtitles at two lines? and 30 characters wide. And I seem to remember being told very clearly at the BBC that that was the way it was done. That's what the Ofcom guidelines said. That's what the user studies had said, and that we needed to stick with that. 
Um, and I remember having a long discussion, basically saying, well, what happens when we've got more graphics on the screen? What happens when we're trying to move into a more exciting environment? Suddenly, we might have a signer as well as a subtitle, and that's going to cut off our 30 characters wide. Why are we still doing this? It doesn't work. There's no, it, it just doesn't work for me. And um, um, why don't we think about trying to look at other things? So I kind of sat at a whiteboard and said, well, subtitles are just words. We know a start time and end time. We can probably break them into individual components. I know nothing about language. I know nothing about words at this point. We can probably interpolate timings between them because when people are saying a phrase or a sentence, they're talking at a regular pace. Why don't we block the subtitles into individual words and then put them back together again in any way we want? And I was pretty much told this is something that couldn't be done um, and wasn't of interest to anyone. And you would break all the rules. Ofcom wouldn't like it. There was no way to actually show it worked. So I basically started taking a few subtitle files apart by hand and saying, well, look, you could put them together in different ways. We could basically write an algorithm that says, I want 10 characters wide, or I want 20 characters wide. And then we can basically, we know the start times and end times of each of the words. We could put them back together in any way we want. Um, and in essence, I was proposing that we could even work directly on the uh, subtitle files. So for example, this is, I'm not expecting anyone to uh, be that familiar with subtitle formats, but this is a TTML file. Uh, and my proposal was basically that we could take a TTML file, um, we could interpolate the difference between the words, we could add a few um, rules to it, so for example, we know if there's a pause between subtitles, we can identify it because we've got the time codes. Um, or if the person speaking changes as well, we also know that so that we have a mechanism for um, knowing not to start combining subtitles of different people that are speaking. Um, and you can also do some basic um, kind of word distribution over the top that says, let's make sure we don't have orphaned words that end up at the end because we'll evenly distribute the subtitles over a phrase as far as possible. <coughs> so I built a demo um, that basically said, well, actually, why don't we have a volume control um, that changes subtitle size? We know the container we want. Um, we can build a, an algorithm to do this. Um, and you could, on your remote control, basically have a plus and minus button that made the subtitles bigger or smaller. Um, and obviously, as it gets bigger, you end up with less lines, but the font gets much bigger. And it comes back to a lot of what Andy was talking about yesterday in terms of personalization. I couldn't really understand right back at the beginning um, of my, my kind of journey into subtitling why we wouldn't want to do this. Surely this makes complete sense to me. Um, and I think it was a really interesting idea to play with. Um, and obviously, if you've got this kind of approach, I suggested as well that if there's a signer on screen, actually, just make the subtitles smaller. If you've got an algorithm that does it, why not? And obviously, we then step away from having a world where we have a subtitle file with um, a set of 30 character wide uh, captions. And suddenly, we can generate any kind of caption size that we want. What I wanted to show you very briefly was where I got to on that first night while I was at the BBC. Um, so here is a web browser. Hopefully, you can see my web browser. Um, I remember very clearly that first night at the BBC um, when we were talking about this, that I was basically told, you can do this stuff on a whiteboard. It's kind of cool. We'll have to get a developer involved. Probably take weeks to get anywhere with this. We won't be able to achieve anything. No one really understands what you're talking about. So this was kind of my first step into this world. I went home that night and in about three hours built this demo. Um, it is a very crude demo. I'm going to let you have a play with it in a minute. 
because I think it's an interesting demo. Um, but what it does is it has a slider at the bottom. As you make the slider one way, it changes the font size one way, or if you go the other way, it changes the font size to make it smaller. Um, and I basically overnight put this demo together and brought it back to the BBC and said, well, look, this works for me. Why don't we start thinking about these kind of ideas? We can actually do some quite neat ideas. Um, and we can break the current format. And it was that first day that it kind of became very apparent to me that if you want to get ideas past someone, if you want to push an idea into someone's head, you need to show it to them. And quite a lot of the time, people won't get what you mean on a whiteboard, or they will, but they'll think it's not possible to do it. Um, and when you can go away overnight and build a very crude demo um, and then come back the next day um, with something to show, it made a massive difference as to how you could kind of convince them as to whether it would work or not. Um, I'm going to pause for five minutes here, and I'm going to paste into the chat a link to that demo. Um, I think it's worth everyone having a quick go with it. Have a look at the video. Watch it from the beginning to the end with the subtitles big, subtitles small. See if you think it works. Um, don't hope too much for the demo. I've basically pulled out of the archive the very first uh, attempt that I made because I think it was interesting to see where we started from. It's not neat. It doesn't work. It probably won't work on every platform. But all of a sudden, I was able to sit in front of someone um, and show them what it could look like for this to work. And suddenly, it, it became much more interesting. So I'll give you two minutes if you've got a web browser to have a look at that um, and see what you think. So has everyone managed to have a couple of minutes to have a look at that? Any Anyone share any first thoughts? Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, I'll share my first thoughts. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's great. It's a new way of presenting the the subtitles, um, as you said, uh, sometimes we are strict to the to be placed um, 40 characters per line and at the bottom of the screen. And, and this is a, this is actually a new way of of um, bringing the subtitles to the um, to the audiences. Um, one of the things that maybe this is because of my background, because I've worked with subtitles, but the segmentation for me um, it. it it comes to my mind. It's it's something that it um, I don't know. Maybe it's me and the audiences feel in another way. So um, uh, I don't know. For for me, the, the segmentation is was something that uh, it mostly disturbed me. But okay. as I said, eh, it's it's maybe because of my of my background as subtitler and because I'm used to that and I have it so at the bottom of my feelings. That, that it appears to me every time that I see a, that I see a subtitle with a, with a bad segmentation. Uh, what I like, and I think it's aligned with, um, there was a time, and, and I think that this is an open discussion within the subtitling uh, research, um, the creative subtitles, yeah. which are now more and more included, but at the beginning people said, no, no. Um, one of the problems that we have as uh, subtitlers is that we are at the end of the production chain and everything is made and then the subtitles come. We never enter in a previous stage. And, and this places us at the bottom of the screen and with two lines. And also because we used to work, or at the beginning we used to work with SRT files. With SRT yeah. files, 
um, you cannot play a lot. And it's a play. It's plain text. It's like a t. It's like a txt. Uh, if you play with other formats, um, you are able um, to be more creative. Uh, actually, um, one things are subtitles, and the other things are um, when you have uh, text in a screen. So more and more series like uh, Sherlock Holmes, they are placing uh, text in a screen in a more creative way, and. To me, it would be very important if subtitles could also be involved in these types of processes, or if we could be more creative in, in this type of processes. Uh, but I, I don't know what the others think. So those are my first thoughts. Eh? And great work. Thank you, great work. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, I, I completely agree with everything you say, in fact. Um, and part of the point of showing that demo is the point that I'm trying to suggest that thinking outside the box sometimes is an interesting thing to do. And it doesn't always work. Um, but sometimes if you can't build a demo of something um, or you don't have a working version of something to put in front of someone, it's much harder to explain and to have a discussion around. Um, and interestingly, you, you share the same views as a lot of people did at the time. Uh, I found when I first showed that demo the next day, the world was kind of split. A lot of the technologists thought it was really cool and the people that weren't familiar with subtitles thought it was great, but there were also a lot of people that didn't want to change things. Um, but it does leave me, unless there's any other thoughts on, on that at this point, I see someone turn the camera on, but. Yeah, hi. Hi there. Hi, uh, thank you for the demo. It's uh, yeah, it, it's pretty cool, and as you say, it's it's exciting to you know, to look at something completely different. Um, my question is um, is around the, the 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 timing, if you want, of this and the extent. So th this clip is fairly nicely paced. Um, so I was wondering to what extent it would be easy from a technical point of view um, to, to have some sort of mechanism so that the display rate would not go crazy. So for example, in the theatre world where, that I know best, you, you, know, you have the stop in the, in the software that we're using so that even if you are pressing a button for your subtitles to go on the screen very fast, you are still you know, prevented from doing that when you reach a certain, a certain threshold. So I assume that you know, with, with this, it would be maybe fairly trivial for you to implement something like this. I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts as well. It's um, interesting because I made a couple of arguments at the time um, and we're going back, this work was five or six years ago. Um, and again, this was very much the first three hours worth of work into this area. So this was very new to us and I wanted to show you where we started from. First thing that I, I found interesting is obviously the reading speed never changes. Um, it's the same as broadcast because the words are just, you have less words the subtitles come up quicker. They're still being displayed at the same timings. Um, secondly, there was some interesting research going on at the time uh, in terms of things like single word subtitles, where there was actually an argument at the time, right or wrong, I'm going to split people here, where a colleague of mine was doing research in showing subtitles a word at a time with the argument that you didn't have to move your eyes so much. And so there was less fatigue. And again, there was an argument that you could then read the subtitles quicker with less words. So there were lots of ideas being thrown in. And like I say, I don't know or didn't at the time know the answers. I was merely trying to build some way to demonstrate some ideas to people. Um, but there were arguments that we could see in every direction. Um, there was um, the engineer in me went a bit further with this as well at the time. <coughs> Sorry, I apologize for the cough. And um, I was also doing some interesting other work with hidden Markov models and phonetic retiming. So I was taking a subtitle file, breaking it into its components, and then matching it back to the audio so that I got per word timing. And so the other thing was, actually, there was a tiny bit more behind the scenes here that the words were actually 
the times for the words were bang on with the times in the audio file, which made reconstructing it slightly more easy. Um, although, as we found later, um, interpolating the distance between the words actually was just as good in terms of you're talking milliseconds difference. Um, and again, we were kind of making the argument at the time that there's a trade off between actually, if you want to watch this video clip on your Apple Watch, you just can't watch the subtitle if it's 30 characters wide, two lines high. You just can't read the text. So maybe there is a point at which watching on a very small screen, um, it's worth the trade off of saying, well, the timing's not going to be completely right or it's going to be slightly out, but you can still read the subtitle. Again, at the time, I was new to the world. I didn't know much about it. And um, so it was just an outsider looking in to say, let's change the rules, see what happens. So that leads me quite nicely on to the next piece of work I want to talk a bit about. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time then at the BBC um, before being recruited by Salford University. Um, and part of me is, is passionate about teaching and university and academic life as well, for some reason. So I, at that point, made the move back to Salford, well, back to academia and moved to Salford University. Um, but I kind of took the passion for subtitling and thinking outside the box with me. And what else could you do? particularly in a world now where you've got subtitles, um, but we've got displays that are all different sizes. They're all around us. We've got mobile phones, we've got uh, watches, we've got kind of laptops that we can watch um, and consume media on. Um, and so I kind of continued with the idea of what happens when you put subtitles into different size containers. Um, and it was at that point I met Pilar um, that you'll all know from this group now. Um, and we started talking about another project, uh, the Immersive Accessibility Project. Um, how many of you people have used immersive content? So what kind of technologies have you used? So we've got head mounted displays, virtual reality. So a few people have, maybe a few people haven't, maybe a few people have dabbled. When we think about immersive content, uh, we think of things like virtual reality, which is where uh, I tend to bundle in things like 360 degree video. I'm glad Peter's joined the chat and uh, mentioning there's also a cave. Um, so instead of being uh, wearing a head mounted display, you can also enter a room where all the surfaces are projected um, in order to build a, a, a virtual environment. Interestingly, in these COVID times, doing tests, head mounted displays are a complete no no because you can't uh, sanitize them between users. But if you've got a cave, suddenly they've uh, become the exciting place again because you can still do VR tests. Um, but when I talk about immersive content today, um, I'm going to focus on things like virtual reality, which is where I would lump things like 360 degree video. Um, but we also have things like augmented reality and mixed reality, where maybe you can see the real world, maybe you can see, um, have a head mounted display that you can see through, and you then supplement that world with augmented reality objects. Um, augmented reality has suddenly become much more popular, um, particularly as Apple, for example, have released um, an augmented reality software development kit for their phones. Um, and phones these days now have accelerometers, high resolution cameras, um, and so are effectively built for doing augmented reality. <coughs> Sorry, I remember when I did my PhD, um, my PhD was entirely based around augmented reality. I built a, an AR interface for transcranial magnetic stimulation. So um, you could take an MRI of a patient's head um, put on a pair of glasses and you could effectively overlay the patient's head um, uh, cranium onto their head as you walked around and looked at them. Um, but that was back in 2008 where the graphics were being rendered on a high performance visualization machine in uh, Manchester University's uh, machine room. The tracking was being done by uh, a very expensive £60,000 plus 
uh, tracking system. Um, and now it's kind of depressing that you can do all these things on a mobile phone without any effort at all. Um, I spent three years of my life building a piece of software just to do the alignment. Um, and nowadays, your basic mobile phone has everything built in to do it. But I digress. So in terms of subtitles, when we move into immersive content, um, we started out with the concept that there were a lot of questions. Um, if we were just to do an uplift of traditional television media into um, an immersive environment, how do you know who's speaking? Where would you put the subtitles? Um, we also have other issues, things like comfortable viewing fields. All of a sudden, we're going to put head-mounted displays on people um, where actually the resolution isn't very good um, and potentially the uh, resolution gets worse towards the edges. Um, and how do you even build a user interface? These are all very interesting questions. If you've got a head-mounted display on, suddenly you've got your eyes covered, your ears covered, you can't reach your keyboard and mouse anymore. Or if you do, you normally fall over the room trying to find out where it is. Suddenly you need to look at different things as well. Um, and there are also a number of challenges if you happen to be uh, working in the industry. If you want to build content for these kind of platforms, you also need some way to be able to build. You need some new tools. You need an editor. You need an editor that will allow you to position subtitles. Um, you also need to be able to test things. Um, and a lot of these questions led to the idea of the iMac project. Um, the iMac project was focused on how do you solve these problems? How do you pull or redevelop accessibility for a 360 degree display? Now, like many of the things uh, researched these days, it followed a user centric approach. It was all about the users. It was asking the users what they wanted working with the users to develop a solution that worked with them. The project started by basically identifying who these users were. We then identified, we looked at requirements gathering to un understand what it is the users needed. In essence, if we were going to build a 360 degree media player that was fully accessible, we were going to need uh, tools to do editing the content. We were going to need a player. We were going to need an entire platform. And we were going to need to evaluate it in many different ways. Um, and so the project defined a methodology. Um, as most of the people involved in this workshop are, are kind of early career or PhD candidates, you'll be very familiar with the concept of research methodologies. It's important to know that the same thing applies to every research project from now on. Um, we defined a methodology for gathering the data, um, and then we implemented and we had several different tests um to see how it went <coughs> so in essence um, i'm going to talk a little bit about what the imac project was but i'll go quite quickly because it's more interesting to get to some of the examples and demos later on um, but the imac project was a horizon 2020 project um, with the aim of exploring how accessibility services could be efficiently integrated with the immersive media so this meant not only were we trying to develop a, a player that had supported 360 degree video, um, but it also needed to support all of the access services. We needed to know how to bring in subtitling, audio description, sign language, and other things. Um, and I believe we all came from the same kind of soapbox that accessibility must not be considered an afterthought. Um, we live in a kind of e-inclusion world. I know I'm preaching to the choir with this, this group of people. Um, but having spent time at the BBC and beyond, it became very apparent to me that accessibility always was considered an afterthought. Um, and it was always built as a bolt on. But we kind of started with the dream and the passion that, well, maybe the accessible services should be developed at the same time as the content. Maybe it should all be done together. Um, and so the project was basically focused on how could we remain compatible with existing technologies formats, um, but develop uh, a platform for accessibility in a 360 degree player whilst following this user centric methodology. Um, one of the interesting things, although the project has now ended as of the summer, there is still a website if you're interested in more about this. Um, 
but it's interesting how cross-disciplinary the team was. Um, we had academics, so we had universities, we had research institutions, we had technology companies, uh, we had a charity, the RNIB, involved. It was a complete cross-section of people that were needed to do this. Um, and it, it was an amazing consortium for the skills that were involved. We also had broadcasters, of course. If you're going to work on a project like this, you need to develop the content, you need to develop the technology, you need people that can do the testing, you need people that can do the requirements gathering. Um, and so it, it was an absolute pleasure really to work with some of these people. Uh, in essence, the project had five objectives uh, and that was based around creating accessible, personalized services for all citizens. It's an interesting word that comes up all the time, personalization. Um, when I was at the BBC, so six years ago, we were talking about personalized services. Everything should be personalized. Massive fan of Andy's talk yesterday where he was putting everything on different scales. You should be able to set the scale for what you need to meet your requirements or your personal choices. Um, we also needed to develop, uh, deliver novel resources for the broadcasting industry um, so that they had the, basically the tools needed to adapt content. Um, and one of the key elements was then to be able to demonstrate these tools and platforms for open pilots. Interestingly, um, user tests, pilot studies before this project, as a technologist, something I knew nothing about. Um, and as I will talk to you a bit later on, I'll explain some of my experiences as a technologist of having been involved in some of these things um, and how it was really interesting looking in to see how it's done and what the kind of output of those things are. Um, and of course, we then wanted to work towards standardization of accessibility and maximize impact on society by delivering something that's useful. So wanted to give a very brief primer about 360 degree video. Um, some of you have said you've used VR. Um, some of you have suggested you may have watched 360 degree videos. In essence, the exciting thing about immersive video is when you watch traditional linear television or a video, you basically have only control over time. You can basically press play and you can watch it playing through. In an immersive environment, you also have space. You can move around slightly. You can move your head and look around. You can certainly survey all around the scene. Um, and if you imagine how this works in terms of broadcast, what we're doing is in essence broadcasting still a two-dimensional video, but we tend to use a format such as Equi Rectangular where you can then wrap that image into a 360 degree globe that allows you to build this full image. This then brings a lot of complexities. Um, different head mounted displays give you different angles of view of that space, uh, depending on what the lens has in it. Um, and obviously you can imagine that if you want to broadcast uh, a 360 degree video where any arbitrary view within that space is still high definition, suddenly you're talking about massive file formats in order to be able to do these things. So there were a lot of complexities that were going to fall in behind this project um, and a lot of difficulties that we had to follow. But we followed a very standard methodology. Um, we went through the processes of um, requirements gathering. We built something and then we validated it. Um, and in essence, we followed a, a diagram that looked a bit like this, where we were following a user centered design process, which led to a series of different requirements for both professional and users and users. Uh, and this then enabled us to direct some content production. One of the problems we really faced on the project were the fact that we had not very much content to play with um, and we needed more content in order to be able to make it accessible. It's still a headache I have today. If you want to build any demos, actually getting content that you have the rights to distribute is quite hard. And so fortunately in the project, we were able to generate some content ourselves. Um, the requirements then also led to the technologists such as myself in the project being able to build the platform or at least define the platform specification and architecture. Uh, and this led to the development of the iMac platform. Um, it was a fairly circular process where we built something, we did some pilots and evaluation, 
and then that fed back into a, a cyclic process of looking at the user requirements in order to iteratively improve it. Um, and as is standard with most um, research projects, we then had these three stages of standardization, exploitation and dissemination at the end. If you're going to do a piece of research, it's so important to tell people about what you're doing and what comes out the other end. Um, and in essence, we built a platform um, that included everything we needed from content production uh, to what was needed for play out at the service provider <coughs> to the content preparation and distribution tools and consumption tools such as a player. Um, and part of the scope of the project was to make the player as um, broad as possible. And as I mentioned previously, um, we went down the route of building everything in a web-based approach, which basically meant you could um, give someone a URL and they could load it on their phone, on their tablet, on their laptop, on their head-mounted display. There was no software to install. Um, and I'm a great believer in terms of building prototypes of easy distribution. There's nothing worse than if you want to build something and show it to someone on an iPhone when you then have to put their phone into a development mode and push them an app or release it to an app store and sell it and let them download it. If you can build something and you can distribute, distribute it as easily as possible, you'll go a long way. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail unless anyone's particularly interested in the, the underlying platform. Um, but I'm sure you can imagine, uh, particularly on a three year project with a lot of partners, there was a lot of work that needed to be done to actually make this kind of platform work. Um, Coupled with the fact that um, broadcasters like to maintain control of their video, so they wanted to have um, the actual asset management in-house, um, and we had to build a, a cloud-based content manager that was built by a company called Angler Technic, um, and included things like subtitle editor, audio description editor, sign language editor. Um, we then have to do a whole load of encoding, packaging, signaling to get that content out. Um, and then we need a player that supports everything from an HBB TV all the way through to a head mounted display, PC, tablet, smartphone, et cetera. <coughs> and the project had some great outputs. Um, we built the content manager and we built the editing tools. Uh, there's also an open source 360 degree player out there, um, which several uh, people are now using. Um, and later on, well, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you a, an example of uh, one of the broadcasters that's still using it on their website. Um, we also had some quite good uh, workshops, events, publications, contributed to standards, all the kind, kind of standard stuff that comes from um, research projects. So as a research project, um, I said it started with the idea of requirements gathering, talking to users, um, and this is one of the areas from a technologist looking in, I think, although it was an amazing process, maybe didn't produce the results that maybe we wanted for moving forwards, I say quite carefully. Um, as technologists, we went into this project with so many ideas, a bit like thinking outside the box with that previous demo of, well, we could completely change things. We could fix the subtitles in the scene. We could make them track users. We could change the location. We could change the style that they want to be. Um, and we built loads of kind of paper prototypes of things uh, in order to put them in, in front of users to find out what the users really wanted. Uh, and from there, we built an architecture, developed the workflow, um, and that's where we got to uh, in order to complete the project. So, to understand a bit more about how this works, um, you need to understand how 360 degree video works. And I did want to dive in a little bit um, to give you some examples about some of the more technical things that are underneath maybe, um, even if we aren't all coming from a technology background. Now, in essence, what we have when we're talking about 360 degree video is um, an image, I quite like using the image of the world because everyone's familiar with a globe kind of image. You know what a globe is and you know what it looks like when you unwrap it. So that's exactly the same as we're doing in terms of um, 360 degree video. 
what we're doing is broadcasting an equi rectangular image that looks like this. Um, and in essence, when the user's consuming it in 360 degree video, they're seeing a very small window. <coughs> so again, if you want to watch this and end up with a high resolution image here, you're talking 8K, 16K video files, which are suddenly massively complex in terms of broadcasting. There's also a lot of challenges in terms of subtitling. Um, how can you make it comfortable? Um, where can you put the subtitles? On a television, um, Ofcom and other standards organizations have clearly defined safe regions where you can put text and graphics. Um, no one had defined that uh, for head-mounted displays, so we had to start doing these kind of things ourselves. We also have to think about things like fonts and text sizes. Um, if you think about some of the consumer level head mounted displays, actually you haven't got that many pixels to play with. The resolution isn't very high. So if you don't make the text quite big, it can be illegible because there are too many dots where it's drawing the pixels for each of the bits of text. Um, and we also came up with a lot of hurdles such as how do you know who's speaking? Um, it's relatively straightforward on traditional television to understand what's going on and see what's happening in the scene. But suddenly in a 360 degree video, the action could be completely behind you. Um, and it suddenly becomes much more complicated how you take people on a path. Do you have some kind of guiding mechanism? Uh, do you use binaural sound to give some clues? Maybe you can't hear the binaural sounds, so maybe that's not gonna work and you have to have other options built in to do these things. Um, head mounted displays also traditionally you have quite good resolution in the middle, but because of the way the lens works, you tend to have um, poor quality around the edge. And so um, it tends to get a little bit blurry. Things are getting better, but on a lot of the kind of consumer level devices, still, if you have text in the edge, you can't read it because it's blurry. Um, and this is a real problem when you want to start um, uh, rendering subtitles and text uh, or a signer, for example, into the scene. So the project prototyped a lot of ideas. Um, these were some of the early prototypes, in fact, where we put things like uh, an arrow on the subtitle. Maybe in this scene, the problem here is this isn't the person speaking. But if you have a subtitle in view here, you may assume that that is the person that relates to that subtitle. And so we played with ideas such as you could put an arrow in there that actually suggests the person is to the left and you need to look to the left. <coughs> One of the exciting things about 360 degree video for me is the fact that quite often I'm not interested in the main action. I'm more interested in what is happening behind me. So we don't want to force people to go down a route in terms of understanding the 360 degree video. We actually want to give them the choice but alert them in some way to tell them that the, the action is happening somewhere else. Um, so we also built um, the whole kind of workflow. Uh, again, I'm focusing on subtitling, but we had a different workflow for audio description, sign language, everything else that sitted on or sat on top. Um, but we had some kind of editor. We had a content manager that sits in the middle uh, and allowed us to push that out to our immersive player. Uh, and there was a, another whole project in there as well about packaging and distribution. Like I say, these video files are massive. And so if you don't look at some kind of adaptive streaming, um, in the end, we used a, a technology called Dash, which basically starts by sending small chunks of file in low resolution uh, in order to understand what the kind of network performance is. And once it knows how the network is performing, um, it allows you to send higher resolution images until it finds how much your bandwidth can support, really. Um, so we did a lot of requirements gathering at, at the beginning. So we worked out what we needed in terms of building an editor. Um, we talked about whether or not professional users would be able to edit subtitles in a normal mode or a VR mode, although we never really uh, got that far with the kind of VR mode because it turned out people didn't like working uh, in virtual reality. Um, and we also had um, a whole list of things that they needed, um, but I'm not going to bore you too much with it today. We also had a content manager. 
we needed uh, to be able to do things like assign assets, different IDs within the data set. We needed some management system for doing it. Um, obviously, all the partners were working at different sites, different European countries. And this is pretty typical of how the um, kind of broadcast world works as well. Everything's distributed. So we needed, for example, a platform where the content producers could log in and upload their video. They could then assign it to a subtitler, for example, like they would in the real world. Subtitlers quite often work from home, so they would then need to be able to connect to this system as well and be able to access things. We also built long lists of requirements for things like distribution. How do you encode the content? Um, again, I assumed it at the beginning of the project that it was as simple as just putting uh, a video file on a web server. No, it's much more complicated uh, in terms of getting the data synchronized um, and encoding it into appropriate formats that will play on your player. The most interesting thing to us though, of course, was the player itself. Um, we had to build a player that took into account kind of the sensory capacities of our target users. This is about personalization. This is about making it work for you. Um, if, for example, you're a user that relies on the access services, there's a good chance that you're not going to be able to manage to use traditional menus, um, particularly, as I say, when we uh, kind of obscure the real world from you by putting a head mounted display on you. Um, and you basically have no longer access to the kind of tools that you need. So how do you do these things? How do you build a user interface that's going to work for low vision, um, for example? Um, so there were initial focus group tests um, where we tested different presentation modes, personalization options, um, and it was identified that a lot of the traditional things were what was desirable in terms of things like colors to distinguish between different users uh, in the same way that a broadcaster's guidelines currently say. Um, although there was at the time uh, consideration for things like different color palettes and a bit of customization. Um, we also talked a bit about uh, in the requirements, the maximum amount of text for one subtitle. And one of the things that really uh, was frustrating at the time um, was the fact that something that came out of our, our first kind of discussions with users was that they wanted us to uh, follow the traditional behavior where we had 37 characters per line and two lines per subtitle, um, which as I'm sure you can imagine coming from the kind of responsive idea that I had in the back of my head was quite a frustrating uh, approach as to where it was going to go. Um, because I wanted to do things differently and have uh, different size subtitles and move things around and, and fix things in the scene and those kind of things. Um, it was also quite important as part of the project to look at things like um, the player's requirements for what happens when you're using VR glasses. Um, there was no kind of standardization that says this is what field of view you're going to get from different manufacturers. Um, there's no standardization that currently says um, this is where it's safe to put graphics because then the, the image drops off towards the edges. Um, and so we had to do a lot of studies ourselves to try and work out where the safe zones were in terms of a head mounted display. And we also, um, early in the project, talked about things like adding arrows, um, putting the subtitle to a side, um, adding things like a compass that direct people where to go. And this was the first kind of ideas that we were putting in front of users as paper prototypes, um, in essence saying, what do you think you would like? Um, and at the time, we didn't have working prototypes of these things. Um, but it was settled in the project that the users seem to like the idea of having an arrow and they seem to like the idea of having a compass, which later turned into a, a radar display. And we'll see examples of those later. <coughs> it was also discussed the idea that there should be some kind of notification for sound. Um, and again, throughout the project, we tried various different experiments with symbolizing sounds in different ways using different characters. But one of the interesting things was that it wasn't particularly adopted and people didn't like it very much. Um, and it will come back to how I'm going to summarize in a minute where 
a lot of the users liked what exists for traditional television um, and didn't really like us playing with subtitles and doing new things. Um, we were keen in there to get a lot of personalization. Um, we wanted to be able to change font sizes, change how the subtitles are displayed. Should it be on a transparent box? Should there be an outline? Um, where do we put the subtitles? Um, could we, for example, scale the video? Doesn't work in a head-mounted display, but potentially moving the subtitles off of that as well may be an option. Um, so where I fell into the project, um, where was once we had a list of requirements, I was heavily focused in the development of the architecture. Um, and again, this is fairly boring and dry stuff, so I'm not going to dwell for too long. Um, but this is what the final architecture looked like, um, where we had a broadcaster who was able to upload content uh, to the content manager. Um, and we also had the accessibility content producers that were building uh, subtitles, audio description, sign language um, files, which were then being put into a separate data store for encoding and then sent to our content manager. <coughs> but in essence, all the content was then published to a web server where it could be accessed from a player, whether that was on a head mounted display, uh, on a tablet, on um, your mobile phone, whatever the platform was, you had access to do that. Now, I wasn't going to talk too much about technologies at this point, um, but one of the interesting ones that we settled on was something called MPEG Dash. Um, and that was a technology that was designed for adaptive network streaming. And I, I think this is a great concept um, because if you haven't come across MPEG Dash, when you use uh, many of the online video uh, producing tools, you'll find that they use something similar. Um, what it does is you basically have an encoding step where you cut your video file, your original video file, into hundreds of smaller chunks. And then for each of those chunks, you lower the resolution slowly so the file sizes get smaller. Um, and when you connect your television to an MPEG dash stream, for example, it will send you the low resolution file to begin with, and then it will assess how your network connection has handled that. Um, and once um, it's ascertained that you can receive that data at that rate, it will give you the next resolution up, which is the next file size up, and slowly get bigger until it decides that your network capabilities can't do that anymore. And you may have noticed um, when watching television at home, for example, if you connect to Netflix and connect to a, a video stream, it starts slightly pixelated, and all of a sudden it jumps to a high resolution. And this is a great, great technology because it basically allows you to avoid what used to be that buffering step. Um, and so when you're handling things like high resolution, 360 degree video files, this is a great way to go. <coughs> so the uh, iMac project was based on MPEG Dash. Um, the only real limitation was iOS at the time doesn't support MPEG Dash, um, but there are alternatives and things like HLS, um, which I will show you um, later on when we talk about what we're currently doing. Um, but it's it's just cool to understand a little bit about some of the technologies behind it. Um, there's also a few complexities in terms of things like the 360 degree video format. Um, when we started this work, there were two main popular formats. Um, one called equirectangular and one called cube map. So the equirectangular format is the one we've talked about before, where you effectively have a single image that gets wrapped onto a globe. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine if you've got an image wrapped onto a globe, you're going to lose some resolution in the middle because the pixels have to stretch a little bit further. Uh, and at the top, you have a lot more pixels to take, make up the top of the image. So in essence, this potentially isn't a very efficient way of doing things because you're going to have a mixture of resolutions throughout the image. Um, and as I say, in the middle, you're going to have a lower resolution than you are at the top. Uh, one alternative to this is something called cube map, um, where you effectively have six faces of a cube, um, and you're basically providing an image for each of those. Um, and the advice, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> the advantage of CubeMap is that you know you're always going to have maximum resolution and the same 
resolution throughout except you're also wasting a lot of the image because you're only using this cross in the middle and you're broadcasting because we're using traditional approaches we're sending out uh, an image that uses uh, the, the full image resolution you're basically sending out a lot of dead pixels that are no use to us at all um, so there are a lot of discussions uh, and decisions to be made and in essence this shows you a bit about how in the middle the resolution drops off with equi rectangular um, but at the top we've got more resolution available to us <coughs> so there is also another format called equi angular cube map um, which has come along more recently which kind of combines the two together to use the full resolution um, and ends up giving us a much more efficient approach but I think it's just useful to have an idea of these different words as we'll be talking about them in the second part of the session today but this is in essence a test that was done during the project um, looking at different formats the equi rectangular versus the EAC you can see in the middle of the image because the equi rectangular has lower resolution in the middle actually you end up with a much more degraded image than you do using this approach and so there were many decisions to be made as to how you actually package up this this data and how to actually use it um, we also had to decide on things like how to distribute the data um, we could send it out as ttml we could send it out as plain text or we could burn it into the video in essence most things these days have gone down the ttml route um, and that is the format that we used um, the ttml uh, is an ebu format um, and they basically have different profiles for different things you can do with it so for example there's a profile for ttml for um, archiving so a whole file there's also a, a profile that's designed specifically for distribution over ip networks and so this was something that was very appropriate to us um, and as we found being xml based you can simply um, add your own extensions into the profiles as well and so we were able to take the EBU TTML file, the existing format, and we were able to add things such as uh, the spatial position that we needed in order to do uh, subtitles in 360 degree video. Interestingly, I say we put the position in there. That wasn't because we were interested in rendering the subtitle at a specific position. It was because we needed to know um, the position where that subtitle was uh, the the sounds was coming from in order to make the guiding mechanisms work um, and we also delivered this with several different video streams um, so we had a video stream for the main content we had different signers uh, we had subtitles we had different audio files and all these things had to be delivered via our, our network so the interesting most interesting part of it was the iMac player um, it used web technologies uh, in order to make it cross device uh, browser um, support any network no need for installation as I say I am a big fan um, and as you'll see in the second part of today when I'm showing you some of the more hacky prototypes we're working on at the moment um, how important it is to be able to use um, something you can distribute easily um, it had to support traditional 2d and 360 video with spatial audio um, as well as being uh, compatible with existing uh, subtitles uh, and those kind of things and we needed to be able to play it on PCs laptops HBB TVs mobile devices and of course VR displays <coughs> so we also had a number of um, you can see I've stolen that slide from somewhere else and I didn't mean to paste it in I meant to remove it um, so the user interface was an important component here um, we wanted a user interface that worked across languages um, and across abilities so one of the things that we found interesting at the time was that there was a, a project out there that was focused on building a set of standardized uh, icons that would represent the different services uh, and this was a really interesting way of doing things because it's language agnostic um, you can understand that this symbol means subtitles um, for example 
And the other nice thing about these symbols is you can actually type them on a keyboard because they actually use existing characters. So we were keen to build something that anyone could use and it was clear where the, the different services were and how to access them. Um, we built a fairly traditional menu system, um, which gave access to everything you needed to do um, in terms of changing subtitle settings, moving their size, where they were, what the position was, um, how to enable and disable services as well. Um, and in a 360 degree player, this is it, kind of what it looked like. It's just a menu that floated in front of you. You had the traditional access service symbols that enabled you to turn them on and off, as well as being able to press play. Now, one of the initial problems we found were that a lot of the head mounted displays don't have uh, a keyboard or a mouse or any kind of mechanism to interact with them. And so quite a few of them have a single button press rather than anything else. And so if you want to open the menu, you suddenly have to find ways to be able to do this without with only a single button press. Um, and so in the player, if you don't have any kind of tool or uh, anything to interact with the player, um, you can simply look at the ground for a few seconds and a menu pops up. Um, and then you can use your direction of gaze to look at the different components in the menu and then press your single click button to select them. Um, if you have the more advanced uh, tools where you actually have um, devices that you can interact with the environment, you can obviously then use the menu to press those buttons. Um, we also implemented the ideas. So we had the radar, for example, which gave an interesting indication of where you were and a spatial indication of where you were. Uh, and as a technologist, I obviously really like this idea because it was clever. Um, the idea is it shows where you were looking in the scene, but it also puts into the scene a little marker that says, this is where the action's happening. Um, and we also had a number of uh, approaches with things like arrows as well that you could put in there. Uh, and it was also extended to do things like multi-screen. Uh, one of the partners in the project was particularly keen about the fact you should be able to consume the same content in sync with different people. Um, one of the problems you come across with head-mounted displays um, is it becomes incredibly isolating. If you want to watch, for example, a film together, um, you can't really if you're watching a 360 degree film because you're kind of in your own world and completely isolated. Um, and so being able to have the same content in sync on different displays um, was a potential first step in terms of solving this. Um, I'm not going to go through far uh, too much in terms of the production tools for the sake of time. Um, but Angler Technic, one of the partners in the project, managed to build for us um, a set of uh, editing tools. These, again, were built into the content manager. Um, so you could log in on a web page, uh, access their subtitle editor, for example. Um, and it was built very much to feel like a traditional subtitle editor. Um, so if you're familiar with editing subtitles, um, this should look very familiar to you. It has all the traditional uh, subtitle list. It has the ability to edit each caption. Um, you can change the character. You can change the region. Um, you can see the sound wave in order to help you work out where those begin and end. Um, and you have some basic formatting in there as well. The subtle difference here, however, is the fact that you can also set an angle. So you can set the location of the speaker within the subtitle file. Um, and this basically allowed us to then create TTML files that had an extension built in that allowed us to uh, store the position of where the sound source was coming from. Um, so, oh, so on the slides, I will share these slides later with you. Um, there is a video on this link um, that will take you to a kind of promotional video that shows you through some more of the demos of um, the iMac player itself. So, in these ten minutes that lead us up to the break. Um, I'm going to point you at an existing version of the iMac player um, and give you a few minutes um, and into the break to have a, a quick play and have a look. Um, unfortunately, the version of the iMac player that I was hoping to point you at today doesn't seem to be running. 
Um, so I've put onto the slide, um, and I'll put it into chat as well, a link to one of the partners of the project who were called RBB, um, who um, are still using the iMac player um, on their website, and there's some demos on there that are worth going and having a play with. So when we pause in a minute to go to the break, if you have a look on this web page, hopefully you can see uh, my web browser that's being shared. You can select one of these videos and it will fire up the iMac player for you. Um, you have to wait a few minutes for the initial menu to disappear. Um, and then the video will start to play. What you'll find is that firstly, it gives you a 360 degree video. So you can use your mouse uh, on your computer to actually look around the content. If you look down at the ground, or if you click in the video, you'll find that the menu pops up. Um, and you can go and have a, a brief explore of the menu and have a look around. Um, one tip, everything on this uh, RBB site is currently German. So it's German files with German subtitles. Um, but if you click on the settings menu, you'll find that there's a, a menu spracker, I can't pronounce German, that lets you turn the menu back to English and have a look around and play the video. Um, obviously, you'll also have to turn the subtitle service on if you want to see subtitles. Um, but hopefully, for the next 10 minutes, um, you should be able to have a look at that site have a look at the player, have a look around, gather your thoughts on what the player looks like um, and how it works for you. Um, and then we'll come back about 10 o'clock um, and I'll say that we're going for a break. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute because I've been talking for a long time. Um, but have a look at that link uh, and have a look at some of those videos and see if you can operate the menu. So really, in that first section, I hope I laid a lot of the groundwork as to where we got to kind of present day. Um, so hopefully I gave you a bit of a background. I told you I'm a hacker rather than a software developer. Um, I made it very clear that I, I'm a great believer in building things and playing with them. Um, and one of the really interesting observations was the first thing was I built something that not everyone liked, but that's cool. Uh, that's fine with me. I built something that didn't work potentially. Um, but again, it's more about the questions. It's more about actually building a discussion around things. And I'm a great believer in the fact that if you don't try and disrupt the industry, if you don't say, well, let's throw away all the rules and do something completely different, you might hate what we're going to do that's completely different. But actually, it might, there might be some questions that come out of it and something interesting that comes out too. Um, so this is where I'm potentially going to start upsetting people because I'm going to give my own personal observations um, as to what came out of the iMac project from my perspective. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think the iMac project was amazingly successful. Um, but I also appreciate, firstly, I was quite quiet and timid because I was surrounded by some very impressive people and trying to get my own opinions across was probably relatively uh, difficult. Um, but also, we ended up with something that was relatively safe. Um, and when I sat down to kind of think about maybe my own personal thoughts on this, as I say, my own personal thoughts, it, it's not anything official. I came out with three kind of thing takeaways that I thought were important in terms of uh, moving this forward. The first real thing that I came across and have done subsequently is the fact that with user tests, from my perspective, unless you're actually putting a working product in front of someone, the results are relatively limited. Stop it. Um, and if you're demonstrating something on paper, 
if you're explaining a, a concept to someone, it can often lead to confusion because maybe they don't quite understand what you mean or they can't play with it. So quite often in, in our world, prototyping things on paper is a great way to go because it's really quick, it's really easy. Um, you can draw things on a whiteboard, but unless you can actually show someone a working product in this area, they potentially don't understand what you mean. Um, and this is kind of where I found an interesting niche that I love working in, the idea that if you can knock out quick prototypes, you can actually save yourselves a lot of work. The expression is something along the lines of a picture says a thousand words. If you've got a working prototype to show to someone or to let them play with, or you can modify it to take in their ideas very quickly, um, you can often come out with much better results because people understand what you're talking about. Um, and one of the observations I found since the iMac project, um, we talked um, in a few of the community groups I'm involved in, we talked quite a lot about, well, what's the next steps? And we did some surveys and we tried to understand a lot about, um, well, the different approaches we could have for immersive subtitling. And every time they put that list of ideas in front of people, because it was a list of text, people didn't really understand what it meant. And potentially it just led to users saying, well, what we've got already works. So let's stay with that. There's no need to actually move this forward or do anything different. Um, and I'm the first to put my hands up at this point and say, actually what they've got at the moment might be the right solution. However, as a technologist and a hacker, I'm keen to try other things just to see, just to see if we can get their interest and to try different things. The other thing I learned was when you're suddenly taking a, a cohort of users and moving them into an immersive environment and asking them to evaluate a project uh, product, it's a massive learning step. Some of these people have never used a head mounted display or an immersive environment. Sometimes they're a bit scared. Sometimes they don't know what's going on. Actually, there's a big learning step. And the only way you're going to make this work is by letting them get used to the technology first. Um, it would be completely irresponsible to do some of these tests with users that are familiar with head mounted displays because you would get the young gamers, you'd get the people that were familiar with the technology, um, but you potentially wouldn't get the people that are in this new target audience that we're trying to adapt new technology for. Um, and so if you're not able in some way to build something that they can play with for some time and actually get used to and familiar with, um, they won't be able to actually give you an objective opinion about it. They'll be more interested in the technology um, and less interested in thinking about new ideas with the technology. <coughs> the other thing I took away from uh, the iMac project is the fact that content is important. Um, quite often we were doing tests with content that potentially wasn't relevant to people or interesting to people. Um, again, it kind of fits back to the learning step um, where if they're not going to get immersed in the content, if it's not a television program they're really interested in, if it has no relevance to them, suddenly they lose interest and they're no longer engaged with the material in the same way. Um, and one of the biggest uh, complexities I found with working with 360 degree video is unless you have a big uh, broadcast house behind you that can produce content, Actually, there's not much free to use content out there that you can get your hands on that is interesting and engaging and will work with many different audiences. Um, and so I have a belief that after the iMac project, when we started surveying other ideas and what we could do, because we had no mechanism to be able to basically say, here's a working product, go and try it. Here's a working product you can try in your own home. So you've got plenty of time to go and play with it and learn it and get used to the technology and here's a product with something that's actually interesting to you, so you're going to engage with it. All we seem to get was the idea that actually what works at the moment is fine, let's not worry about trying to do anything new. And I think that that is potentially a hurdle. Um, and as I say, I keep coming back to my usual disclaimer of actually maybe what everyone's got at the moment is perfect, but unless we can get people willing to try new ideas, potentially, we're not going to find if there was something better. And they might try the new ideas and we might throw everything at them and they come back to what we've got at the moment anyway, which is absolutely fine too. 
So this led me on a bit of a journey, really. So following the iMac project, I um, got involved with Christopher Patno from Google, who spoke yesterday, uh, and I spoke quite highly of him to introduce him. He's a very good friend now and, and one of the best advocates of this work um, that I think there is. And if you're at all interested in immersive captioning um, or any kind of accessibility in an immersive environment, he's a great person to know. <coughs> so a couple of years ago, he started a W3C community group focused on immersive captions. Um, and it was about the same time I'd met him and so got involved at the same time. Um, and we've been working together quite heavily to bring this group forwards and, and discuss new ideas. Um, the goal of the group is effectively to determine and publish best practices for access, activation, display settings for captions, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of augmented reality, virtual reality games. Um, and as he said in his talk yesterday, we started at the beginning where we could completely control the environment by looking at VR and 360 degree video with the hope that when you've got some of those ideas in place, we should be able to then extrapolate them forwards onto actual virtual reality, augmented reality and games and things like that as well. <coughs> um, and so this is a great group to get involved in. And this is um, an area that I, I'm working quite heavily. And if you are at all interested, do drop me an email and I will connect you up with Christopher and come along to our meetings. Um, as I say, they're one of the most fun meetings of the week uh, and really enjoy engaging with the, the community in this way. But one of the problems they hit is the problems that we hit everywhere. So we formed this group and we said, well, the iMac project has done some great stuff. There are other projects out there that have also done some great things. Let's do a survey and find out what other ideas we could implement. We think potentially we've missed some tricks here. We think potentially there's scope to do creative captioning or fixed captions in the scene or display the captions differently. Um, and so they set off on a journey where they, they basically did a full survey. Um, and that survey basically looked through all the literature, looked at all the other projects um, and came up with a few new ideas as well. Um, and so they talked about things like, well, we could have subtitles or captions that are fixed in the scene, but locked in vertically. We could have fixed in scene, repeated evenly spaced based on the BBC's uh, first approach. We could have captions that appear in front, then fixed in scene or fixed position in scene, headlocked, headlocked on horizontal axis only, headlocked with lag, headlocked with jump, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. And the group put together this list and they sent this list out to all its members and beyond and basically asked people to rank the ideas from one to 10 uh, as to which they preferred and which they didn't. And the real problem from my perspective here is what does it actually mean? I, I struggle, I find it hard enough to try and think if someone sent me a piece of text saying a subtitle fixed in scene but locked in vertical, I can't even imagine what that would mean, let alone rank it as, yes, that's how I want to see my captions in future. Um, and how does that actually differ from fixed in scene or what is headlocked, et cetera? What does it all mean? And so we came to the point where we ran this survey, we asked for feedback and um, we had an overriding winning was uh, the concept of what we've already got at the moment. There's no need to change it. Let's have two lines, 30 characters wide, and let's put it in the bottom of the display. And I truly believe this falls back into my previous uh, conclusions where actually, if people can't play with it, if they can't explore these things, they can't see what it means, how on earth are they going to make an evaluation or an educated decision between them um, as to whether any of these things are worth exploring? So this brings me back to the idea of rapid prototyping. Uh, and as a technologist, great believer in rapid prototyping or hacking as I normally refer to it. Um, this comes back to the whole kind of question of what do we think we want um, and how do we even know without trying it out to see how it works? And so since getting involved in the community group, 
Um, I've been involved in three rapid development cycles or hacking cycles. I call it hacking because the idea was you could basically work overnight, you could put a demo together and the next morning you can put it in front of someone and people uh, are so impressed normally when you put something in front of them that quickly um, and it also demonstrates everything that they're trying to understand and suddenly it makes it clear to them what you mean and you can contrast and compare things. I think this is an utterly important tool in terms of research, um, particularly in the early stages of research where you're just idea gathering. Um, and I tend to refer to it as hacking because it's not good quality code. It's not well written. It doesn't work very well, but it works well enough to demonstrate the idea of what you need and you can do it very quickly. Uh, and I come back to my, my usual idea that as a researcher, I hack things together. I know a lot of technologies, but I don't know them particularly well. I don't know the best ways to build things. And I'm happy to admit that because I don't ever want to turn into a software developer. I'm quite happy to be the guy that can build really cool demos and write a specification for something and then hand it on to a development team that can build a proper version. So I'm going to take you through the kind of rapid development cycles that we followed. And as I say, none of these examples are going to be well written. They all try to do too much. They're not optimized. They try to do everything at once. Um, and that's not good for a product. But in terms of allowing people to see what's going on, it is pretty good. Um, and as Christopher Patno mentioned yesterday, he uh, drew a reference to the work and he thinks it's really neat simply because if he wanted to build something at Google, it would take months of development and getting a team in place to do it. Whereas a hacker on their own uh, can overnight throw something together and suddenly you've got something in your hands to play with. And, and that's what excites me about research. So the first hack came along based on <coughs> that list. I basically took that list from the survey and said, well, I don't really understand what it means. I'm going to build something that shows what I think it might mean, because then I can throw it back at the group and say, is this what you meant or not? Uh, and in essence, um, I built this demo and I built it overnight. It actually still exists if anyone does want to play with it, but I'm not suggesting for one minute that anyone should. Um, because it's so badly written, you'll find your computer grinding to a halt very quickly. <coughs> but in essence, all it did was it gave a 360 degree video an environment. Um, it gave a set of captions in there. There were three captions that randomly cycled. Um, and then it gave exactly the same list um, as there was before. I can probably run it actually. If I go to here. So it gave exactly the same list as before, where you could say, I want the subtitle fixed in scene. Or I want the subtitle headlocked, so it stays with me. Um, and it tried to completely replicate the list that was in the survey. So suddenly we were putting in front of people's hands an example of what this meant in terms of the different modes that were being specified. Um, and again, it really did start to open the discussion. It wasn't designed to be a good implementation. It wasn't designed to be a tool to do anything better. It was literally supposed to be something that allowed people to actually, I'm trying to work out what headlocked on vertical axis means, but axes means. So I can look up and down and the caption stays in the middle, um, but it does move on the horizon. And it kind of opened up a lot of the ideas and suddenly gave people a bit more understanding and flexibility about what we meant. <coughs> and this was quite exciting um, because in essence, I built this whole demo in 24 hours. Um, as a technologist, I'm not claiming to be a super uh, clever programmer that can build something in 24 hours. I have enough code fragments and can use Google enough to cut and paste things together to get this to work. Um, in essence, it's written in JavaScript. Um, it uses 3.js, which is a graphics library we've used before for other things. Um, and you can extend that library very easily with something called WebVR. Uh, there's a polyfill, which effectively allows you to build a graphics application like this, um, but 
it instantly gives you uh, everything you need to make it work on a head mounted display as well. Um, and as I say, I was able to hack this together while the conversation was going on almost. Um, obviously, Christopher Patno is based in the US, um, and so nighttime for them is daytime for us. And in essence, a day's work, I had I built a demo that answered, well, implemented all of the ideas they were talking about, but had no idea how to actually see. Um, and again, because it was web based, I could simply send them the link um, and everyone could start to play with this. At the time, it was just a, a, a right free video clip that I'd found on the internet. Again, it comes back to the whole world of content. It's very hard to find good quality content. Um, but it was work. It works. It's a hack and it, it's there if anyone wants to play with it at a later point. Um, the link is in the slides. I probably wouldn't suggest trying to use it because it's resource heavy. It tries to do everything at once. Um, the animation cycle and things doesn't work properly. But it was all about progressing that initial discussion. Um, and I think it did quite successfully. We kind of got to a point where people were understanding a lot more being able to watch a bit of content and saying, actually, I prefer things to be done like this, or there are other things we could do here. So this kind of led into a second hack. Um, because we'd managed to have a discussion around this, and suddenly I could send ideas to people very quickly, and I could say, well, is this what you meant? Is this what you thought? Is this what you wanted to try? Um, the project evolved a bit further. Um, and we built an, a second version, which was more based around showing how captions could work in a 360 degree environment. Um, it was basically a complete rewrite of the first hack and followed the lessons I'd learned from trying to implement 3.js as a 360 degree player with captioning um, in JavaScript. Um, and it basically formed the framework for everything that exists elsewhere in the demos. So we identified relatively early on in this that there were two main modes that were being discussed. So there's headlocked and there's fixed in world. Um, and all of the other kind of uh, modes that were in that survey were basically derived from these two. So in essence, we're basically storing captions either fixed or relative to the user's viewpoint or relative to the world. And by doing this, it means we can drive all the other kind of modes that people were interested in, as well as everything we found in the literature. So throughout everything we're doing, we're not trying to say we know the answers. We're trying to say, well, we can implement all the ideas that we've come across in one place, and that will allow us to contrast them, compare them, adapt them, see how they work for us and see what else we can do and how we can make those interesting. The, <coughs> sorry, do excuse me. The basic premise uh, is around every time you have a caption, you need some kind of information about where in the world it is. Um, and we identified quite early that there were different ways you could represent uh, the position of something within the scene. Um, for example, we have an equi rectangular image, which is the video, which is a 2D video that's been wrapped into a sphere. You could, for example, use 2D coordinates within that space, um, or you could have Cartesian coordinates. You could say, actually, this caption is um, in this specific location, X, Y, Z, within our, our virtual world. Um, because Generally speaking, the captions are always set at the same depth away from the edge of the uh, video. What you can imagine um, is that if you're going to implement a 360 degree video player, all we're doing is we're creating a sphere, uh, a circular ball. And what I'm doing is I'm texture mapping the video onto that surface. And so we can then put the user at the center of that space. Um, and whichever way they look around at the inside of that sphere, they can see the texture mapped video. And funny enough, this is incredibly easy to do in JavaScript, in Unity, in everything. It's how computer graphics works. Um, in essence, you build basic primitives, uh, whether it's a cube, a sphere, a cone, 
you take some kind of image and you wrap it onto that object and that's what then makes it look realistic. Um, so in this world, it's incredibly easy to use JavaScript. You can use the HTML5 video component. Um, you put that video component on a canvas um, and you can turn it back into an image which you can then texture map onto an object. Um, and in this case, as I say, we're texture mapping it onto the inside of the sphere, putting the user at the center. And as you look around, you can see the video. Uh, what that does mean is if you're at the center of the video, the uh, distance to the video is constant, whichever way you look. And generally speaking, it's accepted that the subtitle is then going to be slightly closer to you within there although it's obviously a parameter you should be able to change. <coughs> so it made sense to find a coordinate system to define uh, a position uh, based on polar coordinates, where in essence, what you're doing is you're setting a radial distance that says how far away the caption is, but you're then providing two angles, one on the horizon um, and one up and down that basically says, we can put this caption in any of these places. Um, and the nice thing about using polar coordinates is that if you want to fix your caption, for example, to the background of the video, you can simply align the polar coordinates uh, to a specific location in the video. If you want to align your caption with the user's viewpoint, you can simply align the polar coordinates with the current view where the user is looking. Uh, and if you want to mix and match these things, you can as well which makes it possible to leave things sat um, on a horizon, um, or you could lock things vertically, or you could lock things in any way you wanted. <coughs> so anyone that's used um, computer graphics before probably uh, will have come across something called a scene graph. And in essence, in this demo, all we're doing is we're creating a very simple scene graph where we have an overall scene, and the world, as I call it, is placed within the scene. Computer graphics people seem to have this great vision of grandeur. So we like to call things world and earth and, and these big kind of terms that derive some kind of grand uh, device. But in essence, what we're doing is we're representing the world that we're putting the user in. <coughs> within the structure of our application, um, interestingly, Normally, the world and the scene would be the same area, um, except it became apparent quite early on that if you switch between using uh, a web browser and put on a head-mounted display, all of a sudden, when you're wearing a head-mounted display, you have height. And so in computer graphics world, we have two options at that point. Um, as soon as the person stood up, there is actually no way to tell um, web XR that the person is stood with their head and their eye line on the ground. And so we have two ways we can go at that point. We can either raise everything in the world up to your eye line, um, or we can translate the person down into the ground. Um, but we have to separate out the scene from the world to be able to shift everything in one direction or another. Um, we then create a couple of things that are fixed within the world. So as we move the world, these things stay together. Um, and in there, we have the sphere, which represents our video. Um, we have our fixed caption container. Um, and we also have a fake camera, as I called it, that goes into that space. Um, and so in order to align captions with the user's view, <coughs> sorry, um, we always have to know where the user is looking. Um, and so the most basic way of being able to do this within our, our framework is to have a fake camera that always aligns with where the user's looking. Um, and so that gives us a rotation towards, well, if we align the caption with a fake camera, so a camera that's looking out of the user's eyes, we can always then put a caption relative to that. Um, and so we ended up with a bit of JavaScript um, and 3JS code that basically had two main containers. One that was a container where you could put a fixed caption and one where you could put a container to hold a headlocked caption. Um, and there are a few other things in there as well that you'll see, such as uh, we render in a cone that gives us um, a, a visual representation of where the user's looking, as well as the window they're looking at. 
So in order to be representative um, and pull in everything that was in the literature, um, it became apparent that not only did we have to replicate all of the rendering modes that we'd identified within the survey, we were also going to have to pull in and have some mechanism for building the guide modes that had already existed uh, in, in other projects. So for example, in the iMac project, we had the arrow and we had the radar. Um, and so within the framework, we had to build a mechanism where you could expose the parameters of, uh, in essence, the vector difference between where the user's looking and where the caption is. And so within our code, we had a nice function built in that calculates these things for you and makes it very easy. Um, and I, I demonstrated in the framework, well, once you know this information, using JavaScript, CSS, you can very easily build any display mode, a guide mode you want to on top. And so we added a few demonstrations, such as a big arrow that changes size, because we know where you are, we know where the caption is, we know how far away it is. We can use all of that information to choose how we're going to render some information. So we built this first version, and I'm going to pause talking for a couple of minutes uh, and give you an opportunity to go and have a look at it and see what you think. This was the second of the three iterations. So again, um, I'm going to ask you to have a quick look, um, and then we'll have a, a very brief discussion around it. Um, let me see if I can open it now. There we are. So I'm going to paste the URL into the chat. And when you get into that demo, what you'll find is you have a few options at the top where you can basically change what mode it's currently working in. Um, and you can select between things like fixed in scene, headlocked. And one of the major differences that we made between the first hack and the second hack was the fact that we gave a two view representation. So you could look into the world to try and understand what was happening from the user's perspective, as well as understanding what was going on in terms of the caption itself. And again, the nice thing was, um, because of the success of the kind of first prototype we'd built and people had got excited uh, and people wanted to get involved, we were lucky in the W3C uh, community group that Facebook at the time decided to sponsor us all with Oculus Go's and sent every member of the group an Oculus Go. Um, and so our demo was obviously optimized so that as they received those, they could try these different modes as well within, within there. Um, so you can also change between a few different things. Um, you can change from a, a random player to a real video if you want to. Um, and you can play that video. And you can change how those captions are being displayed. I, you can also turn on the different guide modes. And you can also change between how it's moving around. So you can change from auto move to mouse where it actually lets you choose the view you're looking at as well. I'm going to give you five or 10 minutes uh, to go and have a look at this, because I think it would be interesting for you to see the first kind of main development cycle that we went through um, and to try and get a feel for the kind of things that we're building and understand what, what they meant. So there you go. There is a link in the chat. And I will come back in probably eight minutes at 10 past, and we'll have a brief discussion. And then I'll tell you what happened next. OK, well, hopefully it did work for most people. Um, hopefully you were able to kind of have a look. And again, I'm just trying to take you on a path to show the, the kind of development process we went through um, in terms of building very, very quick, hacky prototypes in order to be able to put something in people's hands that they can work with. And it comes back to my central narrative that I, I truly believe that um, it makes a massive difference in research if you can hack something together to put things out there and let people play with them um, and as well build it in such a way that you can pretty much just send out a link and people can click on the buttons and work out what they mean without too much effort. <coughs> so at this point, we thought we pretty much cracked it. We thought we have a great platform here where because we're exposing the headlocked container, the fixed container, we can build any derivative. We can put other things in there that we want. 
we thought we'd had a great platform and a great solution for how we were going to uh, actually do some user tests and move things forward. Problem was, as always happens in this world, um, we reached this point and said, OK, it's time to build our first user trial. Send me a video. I'll build a caption file, and uh, we'll, we'll try and understand how it works. Problem was, they sent me this lovely uh, video file that is basically based around you sit in a central seat on an aeroplane, and there's a character both sides of you talking. And the problem is, they both talk simultaneously. Suddenly, we've gone from an environment where we have a single subtitle container, um, and there's no mechanism whatsoever to represent two people talking on opposite sides of the scene. We can't specify these positions. In traditional subtitles, obviously you can. There are ways to put the, the two lines at the bottom together. But if we wanted to do a, a test where we were guiding people to the person speaking, which of these two people do you guide them to if they're both speaking at the same time? Where do you put the caption if you want to fix it in the scene? Suddenly realized that it had gone horribly wrong. There was no way I could make this work with the existing framework. <coughs> so this led into a third prototype hack. Um, and this is, again, where we delve into the roots of computer graphics and we start talking about things like particle systems. Uh, I'm a big fan of this picture because it represents the first particle system that was ever used. Uh, and in essence, this was a screen grab from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Khan from, I think it was 1978, so even before I was born. Um, the idea behind a particle system has been used in computer graphics for a very long time. Um, and the idea is that you can create an entity, a particle, um, you give it a position, a velocity, some other properties such as how old it is, um, how it's moving, how it's behaving, um, and then you just launch them. It becomes its own entity. You no longer have to control it or have its own environment. You basically have some kind of code that says, create a new particle, put it at this place. These are the properties that apply to it. Um, and so we decided to, that this was a great approach in terms of captions because all of a sudden we needed to be able to specify lots more captions within the scene. Um, there were also further discussions that came out of the first prototype where people were telling me that actually we want the subtitles to stay for longer. We don't want them to all exist. Uh, we don't want them to play at the same time. If we have to turn around and look for them, perhaps we would like them to stay for longer. Um, and again, this breaks all the rules because in subtitling, it should be verbatim. The subtitles should be playing out in sequence along with the text. But actually, maybe there are people that want to break the rules. Maybe when we delve into the world of personalization, people do want to do things differently. Maybe they want the captions to last longer. They want them to be displayed differently. Um, we're even moving into a world where head mounted displays have eye tracking built in. Perhaps we want the caption to actually exist until the person's looked at it and then disappear. We can do all these kind of things. And I know people are going to be looking at me funny and uh, calling me names and saying, this isn't the way to go. This breaks all the rules. This isn't how it's done. But actually, until we try it and put it in front of someone and have a working prototype, I would argue that it's very difficult to say this isn't the way to do it and that we need to do things differently. Um, and I'm very happy to be proven wrong. And I'm very happy to be proven that this doesn't work. But I'm a great believer in the fact that we have to try it to see. So we built a third hack. By this point, the code base was getting a lot bigger uh, and it was no longer kind of overnight hacks. We were talking about maybe there was two, three days that went into the development of this because all of a sudden there was a lot more going on. We needed to be able to create the captions um, and then manage them. <coughs> so in essence, in hack three, we did a complete rewrite of the caption rendering system. Um, and we basically, built a caption emitter, a bit like the particle systems did when you're creating fire or water effects in computer graphics. And you can basically, within the code base, call a function that says, create me a caption. It is headlocked. Um, it's of this mode. It's got this particular guide associated to it. 
um, and it will uh, exist until these conditions are met. And what this does then from a, a framework perspective is it makes it very simple um, in terms of managing those things because we have a separate manager uh, that runs in a thread in the background that looks after all of the captions in the scene. So for example, if a caption has reached the end of its life or it's met the time code at which it's supposed to be removed, the manager will then remove that from the scene for us. Um, or if the user chooses to override the mode or put it into a different mode, um, they can simply, the manager will go through and set the mode of each of those captions for us. All of that is handled in the background. Uh, and as a developer trying to use this JavaScript framework, all we have to do is write one line of code that says, in these conditions, create a new caption here with these properties. Um, and that created a relatively nice framework for us. Um, and I'm a great believer in code of when you get to a point where all of the caption is tested, the renderer works in the background, it just sits there and does its thing. <laughs> we then have an environment that we can play with and we can do more stuff on top of. <coughs> so at this point as well, we extended the framework out because we had, uh, there were some quite big players uh, such as Google who were interested in looking at this and doing more things with it and building demos with it. Um, and because I was a, sin a single kind of hacker that could turn these things around very quickly, it made sense to start packing in more features to make it more customizable. Um, and so all of a sudden we found we would built in things like Dash and adaptive streaming, um, but not just Dash, HLS as well. You could choose how you got that video file. Um, it will also allow you to load local files if you want. If you're building your own personal project, um, you can do everything from local files as well. Um, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, one of the big limitations is the fact that uh, we're talking about very, very big video files. Um, and so one solution to that is to load them locally rather than stream them off a web server. Um, but the other solutions are, of course, to use these adaptive streaming methods such as Dash and HLS. <coughs> um, because the framework was based um, on the idea of being able to debug these modes, it was important to be able to completely understand the characteristics of what's going on. Um, and so we also extended the notion of being able to auto move to follow a person. So for example, um, you can tell it that I want to animate the fake camera. So this is the camera that represents the user's view to always move towards where the latest caption is. Um, and there are a few other modes that we provide so you can make it jump to it. Um, and as we'll see later as well, we also add extra information in there metadata that describes who's speaking at any one point, you can actually tell it to follow a person. You can tell it to follow the highest person uh, in the order or the lowest person or follow a specific person if you wish, because we have extra information that I'm going to tell you about. Um, again, you can pick and choose between the different caption modes. Um, now, there's a subtle difference in version three as well, where we extended the subtitle file that within the subtitle file, the subtitler can specify a mode as well. So you can, for example, put the caption mode into auto and what it will do is it will use the mode that the subtitler decided. Um, and it was kind of discussed that this might be a good idea that actually for some characters, it might make sense to fix the subtitle into the scene. But for other uh, people, such as a voice of God or someone that's not existing in the scene, Maybe it makes sense to have a subtitle that's headlocked. Um, and maybe it's a nice idea to be able to combine these things together. Um, but because it's all about personalization as well, uh, the framework here also allows the person to override this. So you could have what's specified in the file, or you could say, actually, no, I want everything fixed, or I want it all fixed and repeated, or I want it all headlocked as well. <coughs> Um, again, in this version, we replicated the guide modes. Um, but as you'll see, this suddenly becomes a whole level more complex when you've got lots of captions in the scene. So when you've got more than one caption, how do you represent where they are? Um, and this is another nice component of the 
the kind of particle based framework that each of the uh, captions as we create them handles its own guiding modes, um, which is a very neat way of doing it um, and allowing them to manage themselves in essence. So if you have multiple captions in the scene, for example, head locked and you're using a guided mode that puts an arrow on the side, all of a sudden each of those captions is going to display its own arrow to say where that particular caption comes from. Um, and I am particularly fond of the radar uh, style view, which again wasn't liked particularly in the iMac project um, because I believe there was a learning step behind using it. You had to become quite familiar with it in order to be able to orientate yourself. <coughs> but when you've got more than one caption in the scene, um, it actually becomes quite a neat way to represent actually there's two people speaking and they're both sides of you. Um, and you can do other things like you can change the opacity, you can make them fade out as they get older to show where the current action is, etc. So we replicated a lot of these ideas. Um, I also lifted in things like the responsive, uh, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the responsive captioning library that I talked about right at the beginning. Um, again, this is an interesting idea. I'm not saying it's the right way to do things, but I'm saying it's neat to plug it in and try it and see if more discussion comes out of it. Things like the Oculus Go, you don't have very much resolution. So if you want to display a caption, 30 characters wide takes up an awful lot of your screen. Whereas actually, if you turn on the responsive captions mode, you can make them all smaller and they take up less space. You can still see more of the video. Uh, and as discussed in theory, the reading speed doesn't change and things like that as well. Um, we also added quite a lot of other functionality, things like you can display the current time code of the video. Um, it, it was suggested that sometimes uh, it's useful to know while you're in the video what the current, how far through the video you are, etc. And we built a kind of custom renderer um, that gives you a lot of control over those how those subtitles are, are defined. And this lets you do things like define, move their position. So we have the origin for each caption if it's rendered in the scene. But we could, for example, say, actually, I don't want it at the origin. I want to lift it slightly so it sits above the person that's speaking or below the person or to the side. Um, and you can also change things like the depth um, in there as well. So if you wanted different captions to be displayed slightly further forwards or slightly further backwards, you can always also do those kind of things with the renderer. Oh, got someone else coming in. Um, it's important to remember as well, I said before, <coughs> most of these things can be specified within a subtitle file as well. So for example, if the captioner wanted to do some really neat stuff with creative captioning, they can turn all of these on for you by default. Um, but you could then, as the personalization options come along, you could turn them off yourself if you didn't like it. Um, the captioner, uh, sorry, I'm just going to pour a drink before I cough in everyone's ears too many more times. So the custom renderer also does some quite neat things. Um, it leverages off existing technologies. Again, we're in a web based environment, so it makes sense to use things like CSS to define how things are drawn. Um, and so you can simply specify uh, a small piece of CSS code. Um, for those of you that aren't into the web development world, CSS basically is the scripting language that defines how web pages get rendered. And it's actually a really powerful language because you can define things such as how you're going to render um, our caption within our scene. We can do everything from changing it to a, a gray box. Uh, we can change the color, the border, we can actually start drawing speech bubbles around it or however else we want to change it. Uh, it also allows us a lot of uh, customization in terms of things like fonts, font size, color, whatever we want to do with it. The uh, renderer simply has a parameter in there that says which person's speaking. So if you wanted to, for example, you could, instead of having white, yellow text, you could have the background color change or we also have parameters for the character name if you wanted to put the character name in the custom renderer that you're building. Um, and the custom renderer also manages things like how captions get removed from the scene. 
So all of a sudden we're in a world where you could end up with hundreds of captions if you're not careful. Um, and you can specify this in three ways. You can either say a caption should exist within the time frame that it was designed to in the subtitle file. So we have a start time code, an end time code. Um, and on that end time code, we'll remove it. Or you can specify that there's a delay. You can say, actually, I want the subtitle to remain there slightly longer, another two seconds or three seconds. Or you can also, within the scene, specify, actually, I only want a maximum of four captions to be displayed. Um, and so the oldest one would get removed if the emitter tries to build a caption um, that uh, puts us over the limit for the maximum number of captions. So again, none of this is based on user tests, trials, things that people have asked for. This is a technologist looking in and saying, let's start parameterizing some of these things so that we have a framework where we can actually start to test these things and try them in different ways. Uh, and as you'll see as well, there's also, we take it one step further as well and add location tracking of each of the users in the scene. One of the things I was keen to experiment with with the framework is uh, if we want to fix a caption into the scene, everything that's been done before, basically we have a caption and we have a location for that caption. What happens if that person is walking and talking? We're going to put the caption in the place where they started. Um, and as they walk through the scene, it's going to remain there. It's not going to follow them. Um, and so this framework allows you to define a per frame position for each of the characters within the scene. Um, and it can then be tracked. At the moment, this is a manual stage, um, but I've been experimenting as well with using computer vision techniques to actually derive this information automatically. If you can see a face, you can work out where that position is and we can create an extended subtitle file that basically contains the position of each character um, at each scene. Um, and there's a very crude caption editor and things built into it as well. All the demos that I've been building um, have been built in this caption editor. So there are tools to take a transcript. Um, you can just put a text file in and it will break it into sensible captions using the responsive uh, captioning library. Um, and then you can retime them, um, move them around, specify a particular character and those kind of things. So you start to see that although we started from somewhere very trivial, we've started to parameterize a lot more of these things and add a lot more functionality in there that makes it quite neat for building experiments. And as I keep reiterating, I'm not trying to say for one minute that what's in here is the right way to go. Um, I'm trying to say what we're trying to do is deliver a platform that lets people try things um, and experiment with things. And sometimes they see something that's quite neat and then we use that as information to help us moving forward. So one of the big problems we suddenly came across next, and this adds massively to the confusion, is if you want to, for example, have multiple captions in the scene um, and you're going to have them fixed in the scene to the user that's speaking, suddenly you're going to end up with collisions and they're going to start occluding things. And so we had to build a very basic collision detection algorithm that basically says, for example, in this scene, I've told it I want to keep hold of the last four subtitles. So it's going to display four subtitles, but the person on the right um, has actually spoken and said two lines. If we just ran the code as it was, it would have put one caption over the other. And so we have to basically say the older caption, we're going to shift up to keep the text in the right order um, and make it readable. Um, and so when you have a play with this framework later, you'll see it does some quite neat things in terms of collision detection to try to avoid occluding things. Again, it's a relative hack. So it's just about finding a solution that works to show this idea so we could test it. Um, but it, it's pretty good, but you will find bugs and it does fall over at different times where it can't quite work out what to do. Remembering that our head mounted displays are quite low resolution. If you were to have this many captions in your scene at one time, actually, it probably wouldn't be that readable, particularly when they're that close to the edge. We also experimented um, with a little bit about how stacking might work. Um, 
if, for example, um, a character's moving through the scene and they're talking through quite a big section of dialogue, um, and as part of the test, we've decided to keep more than one subtitle on the screen at once, uh, you'll find that you end up with this kind of neat stack on the left where you're actually stacking them where they were originally speaking, but as the person moves, it gives the next caption above where they've moved to. And again, I quite like this as an approach because it gives me an indication of history of the fact that the character has been moving and speaking because I can kind of follow that flow. Um, and, and for me, I think that's an interesting way to go. Um, but it was identified within the community group anecdotally that, again, that might be confusing. And so our caption manager has an option that you can turn on and off that restacks things and brings them back in line. Um, but the important thing is to make sure that one caption doesn't get drawn over another when there's more than one in the scene at a time. Um, and that we managed to shift the old captions up to bring the new one in um, to avoid that kind of occlusion problem. <coughs> As I say, we also brought in the responsive subtitles work. Um, this, again, it's all about customization for me. It doesn't bother me um, in a low resolution head mounted display, making what was longer subtitles shorter and stacking them. Um, but that, that's just a preference um, as a technologist looking into this world. I'm not saying that this is a good way to go at all. It's just a suggestion as to something we might want to play with. Um, and as I said earlier, um, we had to do some work to extend the guides a bit. Um, so, for example, if you were to headlock all of the captions and say that you want to keep four captions in display at one time, um, you'll find that, for example, we have um this example here where we have put arrows next to each one to indicate where the person speaking is um, again this is just a first kind of projection of the existing guides as to how it might work if there's more than one caption and i'm never really suggesting that you'd have this many captions on display at once but you might do it's all about choice um, but if you did have two captions it would be really useful to know that there's one person from each side uh, and you know where that person is <coughs> Another approach that I quite like that I've tried and I've brought into this framework um, is the idea of justifying the subtitles. Um, so again, if the person is outside of your view, uh, to the left or right of you, we could still stack the headlocked subtitles, but we can justify them left or right to show which direction that person is, or if they're in front of you, they get moved to the middle. Um, and obviously, this is all nicely dynamically animated. So as you move left to right, you'll find that as they come into the center, the subtitle picks up their position uh, and moves in as well. Um, but again, just a suggestion as to what we could do, what is potentially possible once you have all the information exposed in this kind of framework. And a particular favorite of mine is the idea of bringing the iMac radar into a multi-caption environment. Uh, where we might have two people speaking simultaneously and we have an indicator that represents the position where they both are. Um, and having played with it for a while and become familiar with it, it does become quite intuitive to work out, actually, right now I'm looking directly at these two people that are speaking, or if I was looking over here, I would know that they were directly behind me. So again, I find that a really interesting way to go. Uh, and as I mentioned, we can build CSS code in that allows us to build custom renderings. So for example, once you start combining things like the responsive subtitles library um, with a custom CSS renderer that gives us speech bubbles, we're starting to move towards a world where we have more creative subtitles going on. And I know this breaks all the rules and that it's not going to be liked very much by some people, but maybe there are some people that would like this as an option. Um, it's just about having the examples out there and being able to play. Um, the final thing that I think is particularly interesting is within the framework, as I said before, we now have position tracking for each of the people within the scene. Um, and you can turn this on and off. Um, and actually, it probably makes sense if I load up the demo and show you in there. Hopefully, that switches to the demo environment. 
so on my feed, if I load up, um, actually, yeah, no, that's quite a good one. Um, I can turn on show tracking, and what it will do is it will show me within the scene, it puts a little grid over each of the characters in that scene. Um, and if I change from auto move to mouse, I should be able to show this slightly easier. You can see, for example, we have one character here. Uh, and if I press play, you'll see them start to move. But the player knows where that person is at each point within the scene. This gives us a lot of scope and flexibility to do some quite neat things. So um, we could, for example, fix the caption to follow that person. Um, so if we put it to fixed and then follow track, so target set from follow track, you'll see that suddenly it puts our subtitle on top of the person. And as they move, that subtitle moves with them. Uh, I apologize that on my feed, it's probably not very good resolution. Um, but I'll let you have a play with this in a minute. And <laughs> you'll probably say, all of a sudden, that's awful because we're now putting the subtitle on top of the person's head. But this is where having things like being able to change the offsets of the subtitles come in. We can now go in and say, actually, let's shift everything above that character's head. Uh, and when we turn it on, we get the subtitle moving with them. Um, and you could, for example, then use the caption renderer to say, let's have a speech bubble instead. And so we suddenly find that we have speech bubbles that move with that person. Um, and we could, for example, then put, uh, realign all the old ones. And we find we have a subtitle that's going to move with the person. And we can start to build up new ideas and new modes and experiment a little bit um, with new ideas. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to have a play with version three and see what you think and have a look through. Um, you'll notice there's a completely new menu um, where you can load videos from on the server or locally. You can set how it moves. You can change things like animation speed. You can change the rendering mode. So if you wanted to just see video, um, you'll find that this is quite useful for understanding what's going on, or you can have a full screen video as well. You can change the caption mode. Um, and you'll find that as you turn these things on, they probably don't help very much to begin with. Um, <coughs> you kind of have to combine things or think, well, I've tried a slightly different mode where I put a caption aligned with someone's head, but actually I want them above. It is possible to then add those kind of additional functionalities in. You can move things around um, and try and have a play and an understanding about what maybe you can do else with the scene. Um, one of the things that I like particularly is you can do things such as tell it to follow a particular character. Again, it doesn't really fit completely with um, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, again, let's just lift the caption so they sit above him. Um, but it, it's quite a neat idea of what you can do when you've got this extra information available to you. You can start to actually uh, do a 2D projection of a 360 degree video, for example. Um, and what else you can do, who knows? I'm very interested that we have a bit of time to have a quick play and, and have a go with this. And then I'm open to any discussions as well as to what may be the next steps. Um, I'm going to ask you in a minute to have a try of version three. Um, in fact, now is probably the time. If we have three minutes or so, uh, three minutes, eight minutes or so, I'll post the link into the chat. And again, I will turn my microphone off for 10 minutes or so and let you go and have a play with this. And again, it's about building something that lets people play and explore. Um, and any of these modes, anything you build with the menu can then be turned into a test at a later point to evaluate with users. Or we can extend the code base to do other things very easily as well. So I'm going to give you uh, probably 10 minutes to have a quick play with that, and then we'll have a a quick discussion about it uh, and then a wrap up at the end.
Right. Welcome back. So hopefully you've had a few minutes to have a look at that. Um, anyone got any thoughts? Anyone want to say anything about it? Or anyone got any thoughts about whether or not they think rapid prototyping is useful in this, this way? Um, I don't know if I may. Please. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot. Um, I think it's it's an amazing work. It's really, I really like it, and I really think that it's um, a new way of interpreting um, captions in 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 new environments. Uh, my doubt is: uh, Do you think that it, this is suitable for all types of contents? I I have no idea, um, and I'm happy to say that um, I think. That is entirely down to the next stages, which is user testing. And um, obviously, you couldn't give the users all of these options. And it would be really inefficient to have this kind of framework as a player. Um, but maybe there are modes that you can derive from it that, for example, some of the creative captions with, with speech bubbles might be more suited to children's programs. Um, you might find. Um, it's an interesting one because 360 video itself seems to lend itself to different medias in different ways. Um, for example, watching the 10 o'clock news probably wouldn't work very well on a head mounted display. Or why would you bother when you could watch it on the television in the corner of the room with your family? Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done to understand that. All we're trying to do with this kind of framework is ask questions about, well, we could do this, so let's try this, or what else could we do? Um, but I don't know what different content works, what doesn't, uh, that's down to the next stages, really. Yeah, and I also fully agree with um, the learning process. So um, the way we enjoy um, this immersive content, it's, it's different than the way that we enjoy um, current con TV content or linear content. If if you want. So I think that in terms of, um, I struggled a little bit in the, with the timings. So to mm -hmm. me, sometimes I didn't have enough time to read the subtitles. And it was not only in terms of segmentation, but in actual, so um, I didn't have time. Mm. So, Absolutely. That's, I, that's I nice. guess guess that's a problem that a lot of people have identified um, and that's why some kind of guiding and some way to maybe delay subtitles as well for longer breaks all the rules i suspect and does it wrongly but maybe that is what works for some people i i don't know the answers to any of these questions i guess but hopefully we'll find out so because we've only got a couple of minutes left um i'm just going to wrap up really um just to try and tie it into tomorrow's workshop as well. What's next for this project? Um, we're currently in the process of adapting uh, and porting bits of it to Unity because we now have the, the mechanism to have HTC Vive iPro that has eye tracking built in. Um, you notice a lot of the video examples I use are of my kids at home, I'm afraid. Um, it comes down to this whole world of royalty free videos are very hard to get your hands on, um, particularly with good content. So you quite often will see these examples of my, my kid Oliver riding his bike round and round the camera um, just to prove that it's a 360 degree video. <coughs> um, but this is our next steps. We're building and moving the framework uh, as much as it pains me to move it from this nice uh, web-based environment where I can send everyone the link, we're now moving it to an environment where it is an application, but for a specific reason that we can try out the modes we've established that are interesting in the web-based prototype into a, a more solid application in Unity that then allows us to do a full kind of eye-tracking study. Um, and I suspect in tomorrow's workshop, we're going to learn an awful lot more about how eye tracking works. Um, I know to me, this is a new world as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of the workshop tomorrow. Um, but hopefully that's been quite useful. Just in conclusion, I'm going to stick with my three lines that I had before. I think I truly believe that user tests yield limited results unless we have a working prototype. 
And I think this is where we need to throw more technology into the mix uh, and people hacking things together to try things out. And remember, this new technology is a massive learning step to everyone and getting the content right is impossible, uh, important. So I appreciate I've talked for an awful long time. Uh, I also appreciate that this kind of workshop works so much better in a format where we're in the same room together and we can we can work together. So I really hope that this lays out the groundwork really for you know what I'm working on and, and you know the area I'm working in. Uh, and hopefully in the summer workshop, we'll all get together and there'll be an opportunity for me to take this a bit further and we can do some prototyping together and we can build some stuff together in a much more kind of hands on workshop. But I hope it's been kind of interesting and kind of useful. Uh, obviously, happy to take any questions. Um, I know we're about to run into lunchtime, but I'm here throughout the duration as well. So if you've got questions, I can answer them at any point.